We are, uh, we just finished up the book of Jonah, and uh, we're jumping into the book of James today. And the book of James is, uh, it's a bit of a challenging book, and this is really kind of why I chose it. You guys know I like to choose really the challenging parts of the Bible. It's my, my favorite things to teach is the hard stuff, you know, the stuff that really uh, pushes us and challenges us uh, in our faith and in our life. And James is a, a highly practical book, uh, lots of practical aspects of our faith, pushing us in a lot of different practical things and uh, dealing with our speech and the way that we talk to each other, dealing with how to care for other people, uh, how to look out for others, how to pray for people, dealing uh, with crisis, dealing with trials, dealing with hardship, uh, dealing just with our faith and stepping out in faith and trusting God, uh, aspects uh, dealing with temptation and the various ways that we are tempted inside of ourselves, as well as from kind of exterior places where we maybe find temptation. It also teaches us how to love our enemies, the people that just grate us, uh, the people that rub us the wrong way, the people that uh, we just have bitterness towards, we have anger towards, we're holding grudges towards. James pushes us in that and teaches us how to work through those things, how to work through strife, how to work through conflict, why do we fight with each other? Why do we quarrel with each other? Why do we get in arguments? James is going to tell us the answer as we go through this the next couple months. It's a book that really forces self-examination. You know, far too often we go through our life and we just kind of skate through from event to event. And as soon as we get through an event, we just kind of bury it in the past. We don't actually deal with what got us there, what caused that thing to happen. And so James forces us to self-reflect to go inside and to go into just our, our hearts, our emotions, our feelings, and considering why it is we do what we do. Why do we make the decisions we make? Why do we make the choices that we make? And so this book is very practical and really forces us to, to deal with our decisions, with our thoughts, with our words, with the way we treat other people. No doubt you've met many people in your life, maybe you're one of them, that claims to be a Christian and follower of Jesus and, and you're a person of faith, but your life looks nothing like it. You've probably met a lot of people like that. You've probably also met a lot of people who are really good people that also say, yeah, I believe in God. They're really, really great people, good moral people, but they have no love for other people. They're judgmental. They're self-righteous. They think their sin is not as bad as your sin. They compare themselves to others. They're legalistic. So on one hand, you've got someone who says, I, I, I believe, I'm a Christian, but their life looks nothing like God or nothing like Jesus, nothing like what the Bible and what James is going to show us. And you've got other people who look exactly like what James talks about as far as our actions and our words and our righteousness and being Goody goodies, but those people have no love for others. They, they look down upon others. And James is gonna go straight at the heart of that and he's gonna challenge both of those people throughout the entire book that we're gonna go through. And this is what makes James such a challenging book. As we go through these five chapters, the next couple months, two and a half months, this is a tough book. It's gonna be a challenging book. It focuses on the kind of life that we should be having if we really are following the Lord. So if you want a challenge, if you want to be challenged, if you like to be challenged so you don't just stay the same person for the your rest of your life, but you actually want to grow, you actually want to move forward, you actually want to see certain habits and character traits fall off of your life, if that's what you want, then buckle up. <laughs> because the next couple months, this is what we're going to be doing. If you want a church that's just going to tell you what you want to hear and Pat you on the back, make you feel good about yourself, tell you everything's okay, you don't have to change anything, that you're, you're good, then this probably won't be the church for you, it won't be the, the kind of book that we're going to be going through. But if you really do want truth, if you want to be challenged, if you want to face the, the, the sin that you deal with, the character traits that you want to get rid of, if you want to face those things, and if you want to see Freedom from some of those things, those things that constantly pull you back into the tractor beam. 
If you want to deal with those things and take those things head on, face on, then maybe this is the place for you. Maybe this is the book for you to go through with us. I think deep down, all of us actually want that. It's just whether or not we're willing to really do it and go forward with it. So I want to pray right now and just thank the Lord for bringing us here, but also just for this, this book that we're going to be going through, James. And we'll give a little background on the book so you kind of know who James is and what the occasion was, why he wrote this. It's actually a letter, not so much a book, but a letter. Why he wrote this letter. So let's pray together, and then we will jump into James chapter 1. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and need one, uh, you can just raise your hand up, and we'll have some of the ushers come around and, and give you a Bible. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place. We're grateful, Lord, that you uh, have called us to be together on this Sunday morning uh, to sing, to celebrate, to greet each other, and God, to, to get in your word and to be challenged in our faith and to be uh, faced with truth so that we can make educated decisions about our life and, and what we're doing with our life. We don't want to just be like people just walking around in the dark like we saw in Jonah, the Ninevites, who didn't know their left hand from the right hand, but they just walked in the dark, just going through life, just cruising. With no aim, no direction. Didn't have any goals, but just get through life. God, we want to have a, a goal, a direction, an aim. And so we pray, God, that as we jump into James, it will be a challenging book, but it will be a f very freeing book. All the, the truth that is in it just to help us to walk free from the, the sin that entangles us, the things that confuse us, the stuff that holds us back and oppresses us, the fear that grips us, all those things. God, we want to be free from those things and your word is able to do that for us, and particularly as we look at James and the way that he addresses so many practical aspects of our life, how we look forward. As much as it, there will be challenge, there will also be such great freedom for us and a joy that we'll have when we are freed from many of the things that hold us back. And so we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we do pray, God, that you would guide us in it today. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can open to James chapter 1. Again, if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. Uh, if not, all the scriptures are going to be up on the screen, so if you don't have one, uh, you're good. You can just follow along on the screen as well. We're going to be going through uh, verse 1 through 13 today, uh, but we'll just kind of take it in chunks. I won't read the whole thing at first. We're just going to go in bits and pieces. Uh, I want to just read verse 1, uh, and even though it's just one short little introduction verse, uh, there's just a lot in here that we want to be able to understand as we kind of give a framework for really what this letter is all about. So it says in James chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, all right, this is how they would start letters. We usually end our letters, we end our emails with our name at the end. Back in this day and age, they would start their uh, letters with their name. They would state who was writing the letter. So it says, James, and he's describing himself, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and now he's saying who this is to, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Now, first, we'll just talk about who James is because he says that this is me, it's James, I'm writing this letter. You can follow along in your notes if, you, if you'd like. Uh, James was the first pastor over the church in Jerusalem. Okay, Jerusalem being the, the capital of Israel. He talks about this in Acts chapter 15 and Acts chapter 21, talks about James and his pastorate in Jerusalem. James wrote this letter only about seven or maybe ten years after Jesus was killed. So very, very raw, very fresh was this letter written to these believers. So it was written in the early to mid-40s A.D. James himself was eventually martyred in 62 A.D. for his faith. He was uh, taken upon the, the tallest part of the, the temple in Jerusalem. And he was basically forced to walk the plank. They, they pushed him off the pinnacle uh, of the temple. He fell uh, to his death, but he didn't die and so what they did is the people gathered around him and they just threw large stones at him and stoned him. And then one person came in with the death blow and took a big club and just beat him to death. That's what many of the Christians went through in the, the first century. It was a lot of persecution like this. And so he was martyred in 62 AD. He's also known to be the half-brother of Jesus. 
which makes things very interesting. So Jesus, of course, was the firstborn, uh, but then after that, uh, Joseph and Mary uh, had more kids, and it's talked about in various parts of the New Testament. What's interesting to me about this, uh, I remember I was talking to a friend of mine uh, that I grew up, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, and so this friend of mine, we're both Dodger fans, and so uh, every once in a while, every maybe a couple of years, we go to baseball games. And uh, so this is maybe, I don't know, three or four years ago, and he, I hadn't talked to the guy in years, and he said, hey, Job, you want to go to a Dodger game? I said, sure. And uh, so we go up to the game, and, uh, and this, he doesn't believe at all. And uh, so he's asking. He knows I'm a pastor now. And when I was a you know, kid, I was you know, not anywhere near this, what I'm doing now. <laughs> and uh, so he's asking me just all these questions, you know, and, and what do I believe and why do I believe it? And the whole entire game, all the way driving from Burbank to the Dodger game and throughout the entire Dodger game and when we were going to get Dodger dogs in line and when we drove back home, all he wanted to talk about was my faith in Jesus. I was like, wow, this is, this is fun. Baseball, my faith, I mean, gosh. And, uh, and at one point, he, he said, he goes, well, what if Jesus was lying? What if it was just a scam? And I said, All right, David, let me ask you something. Your older brother, Devin, right? If Devin claimed to be God, would you believe him? And he said, no. And I said, okay, would you go your entire life? Let, let's say you guys had a scam going, okay? Like, you know, you guys were in cahoots. We're going to, you know. We, and then eventually David, uh, Devin was killed, right? And then wouldn't you just go, hey, hey, just kidding. Uh, that's, you know, because you'd be afraid that they're going to get after you now, right? He said, yeah. I said, now, eventually, when they tracked you down and they wanted to put you to death, wouldn't you finally say, hey, it was a scam? Would you, would you die for your brother's lie? And he just looked at me, and he said this about four or five different times in the night whenever he'd ask me, like, hard questions. He'd look at me and go, man, you got me there. <laughs> and that's what is interesting about this. This is Jesus' brother who grew up with him. All James would have to see is one time Jesus sins in his entire childhood, and he could debunk this claim that Jesus is actually God. Just one time. One time Jesus would not clean his room and disobey his parents, and he'd say, see, you're not God. You just sinned against your parents. It only would take one time for James to say, this is a lie. But here's James. James's half-brother gets put to death for this huge claim. I'm God. And what does James do after Jesus dies, after he's killed? James becomes the first pastor in Jerusalem. Oversees the church there. He's writing letters to the church, and eventually he is killed himself for his brother's claim. So that makes this letter very powerful to me. You got his own brother who is saying, yes, my brother, my brother is the perfect man. He is God. Now he goes on and he says this. It says he's writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now what this means here is, is this. So the Jews, God's people, Historically, God's people were scattered throughout the world by the Assyrians, the Babylonians. That was called the diaspora, which means dispersion. It means they were scattered. These Jews, when they were oppressed, when they were brought into captivity, they were just scattered all throughout the earth. And so now James is kind of using that allusion to them because now these, these Jews who believe that Jesus came as the Messiah, the Savior of the Jews... They believed him. They said, this is the Savior, this is the Messiah we've been waiting for for thousands of years. So they believed in Jesus. They believed this was the one that God sent to save Israel. And then so what would happen is they would scatter around the land and they would start these little house churches. And so James is kind of giving them a little nod. He's calling them the dispersion, kind of as a throwback to the former times when the Israelites were scattered uh, throughout history. So he's calling these Believers who were, uh, they were Jews by, by nature, right, in their heritage, they were Jewish. He's writing to them specifically. So as we go through James, keep in mind, he's not, this isn't just a general letter to all Christians, both Jew and Gentile, Gentile being non-Jews, but he's, and, and it does affect all of us, even for myself, a, a Gentile, non-Jewish. It does affect all of us, but James is writing specifically to believers who were also ethnically Jewish because there was a lot of conflict that was coming up, and I'm going to talk about that uh, here in a second. 
But keeping that in mind, that that is what he is going after in particular. So uh, here's the background on the Jews at the time that many of these Jews became believers. Now, I'm going to go way back, all right, way back in the uh, family photo album, back to Adam and Eve, way back. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they invited sin into life. They, they brought sin. Before that, there was no sin. There was no trouble. But Adam and Eve brought sin into life. And then from that point on, every single human being has been dealing with the disease of sin. It's this hereditary disease that Adam and Eve have passed down to every single one of us. Every single one of us sins. This is because of Adam and Eve. We cannot escape this. This is now part of our spiritual DNA and because, of, because all of us have sinned and broken God's law, God is the great judge, and we've broken his law. So imagine if you've ever broken the law of our government, that you know that there's like this warrant out for your arrest, right? Every single one of us has broken God's law. We all deserve punishment. There's a warrant out, so, so to speak, for our arrest and punishment. But instead of giving us sure punishment, guaranteed punishment, he promised Adam and Eve that someday one of their great, 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 great grandchildren, a real human being would be born and this human being would be perfect because this human being would also be God. This human being would live on this life, live the perfect life, and he would obey God's law perfectly, unlike you and me. He'd be the only one of all of us that would ever actually be able to do this because he's no ordinary human being. He's actually God incarnate, meaning God becoming flesh. Remember, I've taught you that word before, that incarnate, right? How many of you guys love carne asada burritos, right? We love our carne asada. Carne means meat or flesh. So incarnate means God became flesh. God became a man, All right? So this, this is no ordinary man that is going to be born, but this is God becoming a man. And so then, rather than us being punished for our own sin, this man would stand in our place condemned, He would say, yes, I saw what Joby did. I saw all the things that he's done, and I see all the things he's going to do in the future. And he says to the great judge, God the Father, who is the God of Israel, he says to the great judge, but judge, I I want to stand in his place. I I want you to punish me. I will take on all of his sin. You can punish me, and then I want to give all my perfect righteousness. I want to give it to him so that he could live forever and be with you, and so that he would not have to have the condemnation that he deserves. You can give me his condemnation. I'll take it on. And this is what this man did as he went to the cross. He took on the punishment that, that I deserve, that you deserve. And he was crushed. He was crucified because of what I did and because of what you did. But then in turn, because of his power, because of his perfection, in that very same act, he crushed death. He destroyed death. He destroyed the power of sin on the cross. This is why we were saying earlier, it's to the, to the cross that we cling. And this person, this person would be the Savior. He would be the Messiah, the Savior of God's people, the Jews, so that they could be forgiven. And this person, this is Jesus. This is Jesus, born of Mary in the first century A.D., a Jew, born to a Jewish woman, the Jewish stepfather, Joseph, raised in a good Jewish home, a Jew who came to save the Jews, God's people, the people that he has set aside as his own. Now, the Jews were expecting this all throughout their history. They knew from Genesis that someday there would be a Messiah that would come and save them. So they were expecting this for thousands of years. The prophets told about this. The Old Testament law told about this. So they're waiting with expectation. They're waiting for this Messiah to come and save us from our sin. This is what they are waiting for. But they were also expecting a savior who would come that would look powerful and mighty and great and that he would not only crush their sin but also crush the evil governments of the age and and destroy Rome because Rome was oppressive towards the Jews. And so they they knew that a Messiah was coming but they had their own picture of what they thought the Messiah should be or would be. And so now when Jesus comes and he's born in a, a manger and he's born poor He's born humbly and meek. He just looks like you and me. There's nothing special about the way he looks. They did not recognize him. 
because they had their mind on something else. They expected someone else, someone that would put down Rome. But instead, this guy, Rome just executed him. This guy's weak. That's not our Savior. That's not our Messiah. See, they, they missed it. They missed it. They expected this fierce God. Now, don't make any mistake. This Jesus will return, and he will do all the things they expect, but he had to come and do something else first, and that was destroy sin so that we could be saved. So when Jesus came humbly, he came to make peace between us who are separated from our great judge. He came to bring peace to us between the lawbreakers and the great judge. He made it possible for that judge to now become our father. This judge, instead of condemning us, he actually adopts us. But the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was really the Savior. Up until that time, most of the Jews were trying to live by the law, good, morally uh, upstanding people, trying to live by the Ten Commandments, just being good. And they thought wrongly that if they would just be good people, then this is what would help them get to heaven. And that's what I thought all growing up. I always thought growing up, well, the way you get to heaven is just by being a good person. That's exactly what I thought. And that's what the Jews were doing as they were waiting for their Messiah. But they failed to realize that there was no possible way to actually earn forgiveness just by being a good person and doing all these good moral things. They didn't realize that what they were really trying to do is bribe God. Hey, I, I know I broke your law, but uh, if I just do these good things, if I just go to church, if I just you know, help people out, will you let me into heaven? That's what they're trying to do. That's what we all try to do. We try to earn God's forgiveness. But they fail to realize that that's not how it works at all. So now enter Jesus. See, Jesus didn't come to destroy the Jewish faith. That's not at all what he came to do. But he came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill all the Ten Commandments because you and I, we've broken them all. He came to fulfill all the aspects of the Jewish law because we break them all. And if we keep breaking them, then there's no way for us to go to heaven. So he came not to destroy Judaism, not to destroy the Jewish faith, but to fulfill it so that we can enjoy the fulfillment of it. So that we can actually have the same access to heaven that he does. So Jesus is not an enemy of the Jews, or the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, the Jewish law. Not the furthest thing from that. He came to fulfill it so that we could enjoy the benefit of it. This is what he came to do. He came to pay the price of the fact that we broke the law. Now suddenly, forgiveness is a free gift to us. It's a free gift given to us if we would just believe that this Jesus really is the Savior. But then God, having seen that many of the Jews rejected his Savior, he looks down at this first century and he sees so many Jews, his own people, rejecting Jesus. And Jesus even so to Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept over the Jews that would turn their back on him. It broke his heart to see his own people turn their backs on him. But this did not stop God from giving up on humanity. He didn't sit there and go, I'm not playing anymore. These guys just reject. My own people rejected my son, my savior. I'm not playing anymore. That is not at all what God did. God, because of his compassion, because of his great love for even lawbreakers and sinners, what he did is he said, look, here, this is... This is this is what I'm going to do. This salvation, this is not just for the Jews, but I'm, I, I want Gentiles, I want non-Jews. If non-Jews would see that my son is a savior, I will save them. They don't have to become Jewish first. They don't have to do all the Jewish rituals. I, I'm going to save anyone who would believe in my son. And so now this salvation was seemed to be opened up to, to all of humanity, anyone who would come to Jesus. Anyone who would come after my son, I will save them. I will not turn them away if they believe in my son. And from that, a controversy started to arise in the first church, meaning the first believers. After Jesus died and people started believing, some were Jews that started believing in Jesus, some were non-Jews, Gentiles. And now you've got these two different kind of camps of people with different values and different backgrounds, and they're believing the same Jesus. So some conflict is happening in the first church. There's a lot of disagreement that's going on. Now, some of the differences between these Christians who were Jewish in their heritage and these Christians that were non-Jewish in their heritage, uh, the Jews who believed that Jesus was indeed the sent Savior, 
they had very much been, as I mentioned, focused on their works and doing right as a way to be saved to salvation. Now, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, they were excited because they'd been living their lives like crazy, right? I mean, just doing whatever the heck they wanted to do, and all of a sudden, like, hey, free salvation, cool. And, and that really bummed the Jews out. Like, what, what do you mean they just get it for free? Like, we've been trying, we've been working so hard over here to be good moral people, and you're just going to give salvation to these guys? They haven't done anything that we've had to do, right? And so there's this kind of controversy, a little bit of jealousy going on. And so these Gentiles are saying, yeah, we don't have to do anything to be saved. And the Jews are like, no, you got to do all these things to be saved. Well, who's right? Well, the answer is actually neither one of these guys are right. And that's what James is going to approach in the coming verses. He's going to get to the heart of, of what does it look like, whether you're Jew or Gentile, what does it look like to really believe in Jesus and follow him? That's what he's going to be going after. He wants to, he wants to help the Jewish believers through this letter to find the balance to find the balance and to find the proper place of Jesus in their life and the proper place of their own morality. This is what James wants to do. Now, Paul makes a similar distinction in Romans chapter one through three. All right, Paul, the apostle, who was a Jewish Pharisee who became a believer. In Romans one, he talked about the Gentiles. These guys are just going crazy, doing whatever the heck they want to do with their life. And he said, these guys... They got it coming to them. They're just rejecting God and God's judgment will be upon them. Now the Jews that are probably reading the book of Romans are going, yeah, serves those guys right. Look at those guys just living life however they want. But then in chapter two, Paul says, but you Jews, you guys are, you guys are great. You guys are good people, morally upstanding. But guess what? You've also broken God's law. And so then in Romans chapter 3, this is where we have the famous Romans 3.23. He says, none of you are good compared to God. Jew or Gentile, none of you are good. No one is righteous. No, not one. Not one of us is righteous. Every single one of us has broken God's law. Whether you've tried to hold the Ten Commandments as a good Jew, or whether you're a Gentile going out and just doing whatever the heck you want, all of us, some point in our lives, we have broken God's law all of us fall short of God's glory. All of us need forgiveness from a Savior. And he goes on in 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 and beyond in Romans, and he says, this is Jesus. Jesus came to do this for you. Jesus came to save the Jews. Jesus came to save the Gentiles. All right, so going in, so that's verse 1. <laughs> verse 2 through 4 here. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials and temptation, church, are inevitable. It's not if they happen, it's when they happen. You will go through trials. You will go through hardship in your life. You'll have problems in your marriage. You'll have financial problems. You'll have conflict with your friends. You will face sickness, you will face disease, you will face death, death of loved ones, and your own death. We're going we're gonna to face trials. We, we just cannot get out of this because this is part of living in a fallen world that was invited in by Adam and Eve. Now, the word here in the Greek, so the, the New Testament was mostly written in Greek. The word here for trial and also for temptation is actually the same word. It means to put to the test in a hostile sense. So, Trials really are things that happen on the outside, right? Financial hardship, marital problems. Okay, those are trials. Those are tests, hostile tests in our life. But temptation is the same exact thing, but it's on the inside. So temptation we deal with on the inside, trials we deal with on the outside. But they're actually the same thing, the same word used in the Greek here. So these different things, trials... For instance, trials are going to tempt you, and temptations are going to try you. Right? You hear what I'm saying here? Is that, that these things are kind of one and the same. They're going to sort of do the same thing. Exterior things are going to tempt you, and your temptations are going to try you. They're going to try your faith. They're going to challenge your faith. But these things are meant, James says, to bring out steadfastness, the ability to last, to endure, to be sure-footed, to be confident, to be firm, to not waver, 
even when bad things come in, you're still, you're solid. Something about you is solid. Now, I'm not going to press this too much. We'll kind of go through this quickly because we looked at this a lot in the book of Jonah, right? Looking at just trials and the way that trials change our lives for the positive. But I'll mention this, that this is in your notes. You can follow along here. God will take you where you have not intended to go in order to produce in you what you could not achieve on your own. See, God will take you places into trials and certain hardships, places you would never choose for yourself to go. You'd never choose for even your friends to go or even your enemies to go. You will go places and go through certain trials that you would never wish upon even your enemies. But you go there because God works in you something that you could never achieve on your own. Something about your character changes. I have often said for myself that I would never, I would never have chosen to lead a church. This is like the, if you do a personality test and all those kind of things. You know, if I was to talk to a guidance counselor in high school, they would have said, "Yes, steer clear of that one, buddy." <laughs> right? I mean, I just this is so just not in my wheelhouse as far as just how I'm I'm wired. And I would not have chosen this. The way there's, there's just a certain thing that it just has a way of, of stripping you, a way of just humbling you and, just, and really just crushing you. And I just, I would not have chosen this. But the way that I've grown in my life, the way I've changed in my life, and, and I would not want to do anything else. Yet I would never have chosen it. It's very strange. But yet I love what I do. But I wouldn't have chosen it for myself. I've talked somewhat frequently the last few months about even just my own battle and challenge with depression, just discouragement. Going back historically, back into high school, and I never would have chosen that for me. I mean, who would choose that, you know? Who would choose that? But yet I would not give it up for anything because of the way that not only have I learned so much about myself and learned about the Lord and, and, and God's goodness and his grace towards me and the way his strength carries me through things, and not to mention the way that the Lord has used me to help other people get through their own depression, their own battles, their own discouragement. I would not have chosen it for myself, but, but God has worked in me things that I could not have ever worked out, things that I've grown in that I could never have grown in unless God took me through that. I mean, there's countless things. I, I can think, I mean, I just had five or six different things that came in my mind that I say, God, thank you that you've brought me into that challenging aspect, that trial, because you've shaped me through it, and I, I love what you've done. At the time, I didn't like it, but I love what you've done. In your notes again, it says, the way you respond to difficulty will show what is most important to you. It shows what you truly value. How you respond to difficulty shows what you really value. You can follow along here. Do you run when there's conflict? When there's conflict in your life, in your family, or in your relationships, do you run from that? Do you hide from it? If so, then comfort and self-preservation, is that's what's most important to you. Do you blow up in anger? If you do, then being in control is what is most important to you. Do you hold grudges, or do you go silent? If you do, then being right is most important to you. You'd rather be right than be connected with your friends, your family. When there's conflict, do you just try to fly under the radar and just avoid it? You still want to, you know, uh, ruffle anyone's feathers? You just want to kind of gloss over it? If so, then the praise of man and being accepted by others, that's what's most important to you. All of these responses, by the way, are just you making yourself the center of your life. You're just, you're the king, you're the queen of your own world. That's what we, that's what we do. But you will, church, you will enter into things, events, situations that you never would have chosen for yourself. But this is to produce steadfastness is what James says. This is what is used in your life to, to make you solid, to make you firm, to give a conviction to you. Now, he seems to tie this together with a command in the next verse, in, in verse 5. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, he's not changing the subject. He's not saying, oh, and by the way, if any of you guys need wisdom, God's doling it out for free. Right? He's not changing the subject. See, we need wisdom. We need wisdom when we're going through trials and going through suffering, going through challenges. And he says, so if any of you guys need wisdom, and I look at that and I go, that's me. 
He's talking about me right now. I need wisdom. I need wisdom in my life. Because life gets confusing. Life gets challenging. I get discouraged. I get down. I get so focused on myself. I get so focused on, on the trials in my life. And I lose focus. I lose my footing. I feel like I slip and I fall sometimes. So I need wisdom. I need wisdom because I'm confused. My emotions are getting the best of me. So I, I've got it. I need wisdom from something else that is not me because I'm confused in my own heart. My heart, my perspective is getting to me. And so he says, now, if anyone needs wisdom, go to God because he will give it to you generously if you ask, if you desire this. But then he says, there's a little caveat to this. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. So if you want wisdom, you gotta ask in faith with no doubting because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. That person isn't, that should not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man. A double-minded man. This is a, a phrase that James seemed to have coined. It means a, a man who almost has two souls. He's got two different wills going on. He's divided. He's got two motives. He's unstable in all of his ways. Now, before you kind of freak out over this whole thing of like, you can't doubt at all if you pray, all right? The word doubt here is not the exact kind of doubt that you might be thinking of. Because the very fact of faith, if you, have, if you put faith in something, that necessitates that there's a little bit of doubt, right? Because if there was no doubt, it wouldn't be called faith. It just, it's just like facts. It's just, you know, 100% sure, right? So, so faith, there, there's always gonna be some doubt in your life when it comes to putting faith. That's just that's part of the definition of faith, Stepping forward when there are things in doubt. You step forward in faith. So it's not that. It's not the, oh, I'm not quite sure. It's not that. It's not, that's not what we're talking about here. The word here, again, in, in the Greek is different. It's, it's, more, it's more bold. It's deeper than that. It's, it's about not being divided. Not with two separate agendas. As if you're two different people wanting two different things. Speaking more of having a commitment to one agenda, single-mindedness. You have that one agenda. You might, you might doubt a little bit, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about not having two agendas, an ulterior motive, because it's not that we're never going to doubt. We're going to doubt, but we go forward in our faith and with trust, even with our various hesitations, and yet with a conviction. And he gives this picture of a wave and wind. See, a wave just goes wherever the wind pushes it, Right? So for many people, what this double-mindedness looks like is one day they want the wisdom of God, they want to do things God's way, but the next day they just want to do it their way. One day they want God's will, but the next moment they're just very self-focused. Or maybe more specifically, maybe you ask God, you say, God, would you just bless us financially so we can help other people? But deep down you want God to bless you financially because you just want to be comfortable. That's the kind of doubt we're talking about. That's the kind of double-mindedness we're talking about. Or maybe you ask God to change your spouse. Will you just change my spouse? Just so we can, you know, have this great marriage. We can honor you and glorify you and be a good example to others. And really all you want is just to be right. You just want your spouse to change so that you can be vindicated. All right, that's the double-mindedness we're talking about. That's what he says not to do. That's a divided person. Church, there is a war going on inside of your hearts. There are two different desires that are constantly at odds. And this is true for all of us. Uh, this summer, uh, I asked to get together with uh, a few boys from uh, our baseball team this year. And uh, I wanted to get them together. And so I got six boys, including my son. And, uh, you know, we call this a fight club. Like a lot of us, we, we call that just when we get together to encourage each other. And I asked these boys to get together. There's, Six of them, so it's, uh, they're age 13 and 12, and we're in my office, and so you can imagine after they're all done, when they leave, my office smells like a junior high locker room. And we're sitting there, and, uh, <laughs> and at first I'm kind of going, I'm gathering these boys together, and I'm going, what am I doing here? <laughs> here I am with these you know, 12-year-olds, and we're going to just talk about life. We're going to talk about what it means to be a real man, and growing up to be a real man, and 
uh, character and integrity and all these different things. And I was telling these boys, I said, boys, you guys got to understand that I'm actually in the same boat as you guys. I mean, I'm, you know, many years older than you, three times older than you. But we're not really that much different. Because inside your heart, there's going to be things that are going to pull you in opposite directions. But I'm 38 years old, and I've, I deal with the same exact stuff. My, my heart's divided a lot of times. And so I'm here as being 38, and I want to help you guys get through this awkward period of your life. 12 years old going into 13, these eighth graders. And trying to figure out how to go through life with divided hearts and how to make better choices as they get older. And so as we were talking, uh, one of the boys, my buddy, his name is Jack, he says, coach, I'm coach to them. To you guys, I'm pastor. To them, I'm coach. He said, coach, when I asked the boys after our first one, I, I, said, uh, I said, hey, how was this, boys? How was this first time? What do you guys want to talk about this summer? What are the things you guys want to talk about? And we had some different examples. One of the boys, Zach, he said, uh, you know, he wanted to talk about peer pressure. I want to talk about just, just being strong. And when you're faced with peer pressure, I'm like, man, that is like perfect. Because that is, and, then, and you know, this is something that not just 12-year-olds deal with, but this is what we deal with as adults, right? We deal with peer pressure, whether we like to admit it or not. One of the other boys said puberty and, and just uh, the hormones and emotions and stuff. And I thought, man, next time I'm going to have to like, wear a hazmat suit or something like that if we're going to get into that conversation there. And, and uh, I told the parents that in an email and... Uh, and then Jack said, he goes, Coach, I want to I get into the heart. I want to get into just deep into the heart. It's where my emotions are. And then another boy said the same thing. He goes, yeah, we want, I want to have real talk about real stuff. And I was just thinking about that answer. I thought about it a lot because that is exactly right. Church, we've got to get into the heart of our own selves because our hearts are divided. And these boys, they know it. They're dealing with peer pressure. They're dealing with temptations. They know that their hearts are divided. They want this thing, but they know that this thing is the right thing, but they still want this thing so bad. It's just like all of us adults, us big kids. Now, when your heart's divided, you will be driven like a wave by the winds, by peer pressure very easily. But peer pressure won't affect you if you're single-minded, if you've got that conviction, if you've got that goal. But if you don't, if your heart is divided, you'll be driven by envy and jealousy. You'll be driven by comfort. You'll make all your decisions based on getting what you want, or on greed, or on pride, or on your ego, whatever feels good at the time. You'll be driven by bitterness. You'll be driven by fear. One of the boys, not in our group, but separately, said that he deals with fear a lot. And as a dad... And here's this 12-year-old telling me he deals with fear a lot that breaks my heart. And that's why I, 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 that's why I love getting together with these boys. I love these boys. And I'm 38, and I'm still confused by life. And I'm thinking, these guys, you know, <laughs> they're just getting into the confusing parts of life. This is why I love spending time with my boys. So oftentimes, church, we ask for wisdom. We ask for God's help. But what we're really asking him for is to just to fix our problems. And that's what he's saying. Don't be double-minded. See, what we're saying when we do that, we're saying, uh, we're saying, God, give me wisdom. Give me this. Give me that. But what, we don't really want God in our life when we're doing that. We just want the blessings of God in our life. We don't really want God in our life. We just want him to help us through life. It's not really God that we want. We just want his goodness. We just want his gifts. We just want him to help us and to, to make it about us. We don't want to make it about him. We want him to make it about us. That's the double-minded man. That's the man who is unstable in all of his ways, who's going to go through life like a wave being tossed to and fro by the wind. Whatever wind comes in that day, bitterness, envy, strife, self-centeredness, greed, pleasure, all these things are going to drive the person. They will be unstable in all of their ways. You ever have a friend who just uses you? You know what I'm talking about? They, they only call you up when they need something. Right, that's what we're talking about here. That's, this is what we do with God. We call out to him and we cry out to him when we just need something, we want something. We don't really want him, but we just want his stuff. 
Uh, and you know, you know how that feels, right? When you've got that friend who you notice uses you for something. It's not good. But this is exactly what we do with our God, our Father. This is what we do with our Savior. We only call out to him when we need something. That's the kind of dividedness that James is talking about. So he goes on. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. So if you have nothing, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flowers fail, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. See, in your life, church, whether you're rich or you're poor, popular, not popular, sick or healthy, no matter what, your circumstances and your situation, that is not what matters. That is not what matters because everything we have will pass away. Just like the sun's gonna scorch the flowers, everything. So rich or poor, high or low, that is not what matters. What is external is not what matters. Beauty is fleeting. Money is fleeting. Popularity is fleeting. It doesn't last. The truth is, church, is you can have a completely out of control life circumstantially and yet still be solid. You can have chaos all around you and yet be firm footed. If you learn to put to death that double-mindedness, if you ask God for wisdom, in your notes it says this, that the instability of your life, meaning your outside circumstances, your marriage, your money, your health, all those things, the instability, if those things are out of control right now, the instability of your life has nothing to do with your distance from God. If you're feeling distant from God today, it has nothing to do with what's on the outside of you. Rather, it's the disloyalty of your heart. It's the double-mindedness of your heart. It's the fact that you don't have a single-minded drive towards the Lord. Now, again, you're not going to be perfect in that. You're going to have doubts. You're going to have sin. You're going to, you're going to fail and fall all over the place. But when you have a resolve that says, I, I want to chase after God. I want to chase after him. I know that I need to make him central. So it's not because of your circumstances. You can't blame anyone else or anything else on that. It's it's on where and how your heart trusts and what you're putting your trust into. That's the double-mindedness that makes you unstable in all of your ways. Being oversensitive, all right? That's from double-mindedness. You're focused too much on exterior things, so you're becoming oversensitive. But that's not the problem. The the oversensitive part of your life is because the double-mindedness, the disloyalty in your heart, when you're over-emotional, You overreact to things. When you're fearful, you're anxious. That's all has nothing to do with the outside. It's all about what's going on inside of here. We don't have and haven't asked for the wisdom of God, and that's what keeps us unstable. And he closes with this last verse here. Blessed is a man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Church, God has made a promise. He made a promise to both Jew and Gentile that when we believe that we have sinned, when we believe we've broken his law, when we admit our double-mindedness, when we admit, you know what, yeah, I, I got two motives going on here. I'm just gonna be totally honest. Church, I've, I've got two, two minds going on sometimes. I, sometimes I'm just wanting things for the Lord. Other times I'm just wanting things for myself. There's nothing in me that is perfect whatsoever. When we come to a place where we say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm a lot worse off than I thought I was. I thought I had my act together, but I really don't. When we come to that place, we realize that we can't fix it ourselves. We realize we need to be saved even from our own selves. And we believe that God has made a way by sending his son, the Messiah, the Savior, to stand in our place When we believe that, he gives us the crown of life. This crown of life is not like a metal and gold crown. It's more along the lines of like the victory wreath that you'd wear in this day and age after a marathon. So it's it's really more of a picture, not of being like a king, but more of finishing a race, completing a marathon. 
Church, if we believe that God has sent his son, and he did this for us because of his love for us, even though we've broken his law, he said, I'm not gonna condemn you, but I'm gonna come up with a solution for you. When we believe, he says, I will give you the crown of life so that when you finish the race, when you get through this life filled with trials, this life filled with tragedy, when you get through all the challenges of life, you cross that finish line, I will give you the crown of life. Though you didn't earn the crown of life, you didn't have to do all these things to get it, you just had to believe in my son. Believe that I sent him to save you. And if you do, I will give you the crown of life. This is what God has promised his people, whether Jew or Gentile, that part doesn't matter anymore. But anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, will be saved and given this crown of life. So when he does this, and he sees us through our life, and he will do this even amidst your weakness, you will say, yes, Lord, I, I want you, I need you. And then the Holy Spirit will come into your heart, he will make you alive, to start changing things slowly but surely, kind of renovating your heart, renovating your mind, changing the way you see things slowly but surely. Things are gonna be different than they were a few months ago. You're gonna desire different things and it's just, it's kind of a weird, it's, it's kind of like spiritual puberty, you know? It's like, <laughs> and it's just kind of an awkward transition, you know? And, and this happens with us and, and through all that, you're gonna fail and you're gonna mess up and you're gonna doubt, but here's the great promise that God gives us. He doesn't just say, cool, thanks for believing in my son Jesus, hope you make it to the end. No, he, he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my Holy Spirit inside of you so that you actually make it to the end. And he promises that you'll make it to the end because it's by his power, not by your own power, not by your own strength, but by his strength. He promises that anyone who comes to him, he will bring to the finish line. Even through all the challenges of your life, he will get you there. It won't be upon you, it's gonna be on him because he loves you, because he promised you, because Jesus paid for you. Jesus paid for you so the Father's not gonna give up on you. He's gonna take you to the end. You will see that day when you stand before him face to face and we get to enjoy eternal life forever and ever with our Lord. But this is only through the gift of his son. And this is what James is gonna be focused on the next couple months, is how to have this stuff work out in our lives. What does this look like? If we believe this, what does that look like in our life? So I wanna close and pray now and thank the Lord for this, this, this truth. And, and I know it's, a lot of this is just, it's, it's heavy truth for us. But we thank the Lord that he doesn't just give us the bad news about our sin, but he gives us the good news of his son, Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you did not give up on your people. You did not give up on the people that you set aside for salvation. You didn't give up on humanity. You could have. And by some arguments, you should have. The way that we <laughs> treat you left and right. We absolutely, we don't deserve any kind of forgiveness. But because of your own goodness, because you give graciously and generously without reproach, because you give regardless of how good or bad we are, you don't, you don't look at how much sin we have and then decide on if you're gonna save us or bless us. You, you, just, you look at your own self and say, I, I'm a good God, and so because I'm a good God, I wanna give this blessing, I wanna save these people. God, when you found me when I was 18 years old, running from you, not caring anything about you, doing anything I wanted to do, with no care or desire for you whatsoever, you found me at 18 years old. I wasn't looking for you, I didn't wanna be around you, but you tracked me down. You opened my eyes and you showed me that I was in deeper trouble than I thought. But then you showed me that you came up with a solution for me. And I'm just amazed by that, God. I'm amazed that you've done this for me. I'm amazed that you've done that for so many of my friends. And I thank you so much that you are continuing to do that in so many lives around us. So Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We're grateful for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.